perspective. And so there's really two parts of why environmental accounting is important from a corporate perspective. So one of them is to identify nature related risks in operations. The other one is to identify opportunities that are relevant to nature and the environment you're uh, operating in. And so while this sounds really high level, um, it is something that is becoming the norm for larger organizations. Um, there is something coming in the next few months, which is called the Task Force for Nature and Financial Related Disclosures. And this is um, um, kind of umbrella framework under the UN, which will require all large organizations to actually report on nature impacts and opportunities. And we know that when those things happen, it does trickle down into the supply chain. So the idea with today is to kind of give an, um, give you a picture of what is coming for a lot of supply chains um, and also get you familiar with the language that is being used in this space. So Accounting for Nature is a relatively young non-for-profit. We have been around for about four years now in our non-for-profit form. But we come from around 15 years of research from something called the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists. So this is a group of some of the most uh, prominent researchers in Australia, in particularly related to environmental questions. And so they sat down in the Wentworth pub, I think this was about 2005, and talked about how powerful would it be, uh, especially from a political point of view, if every day when we opened the newspaper, we could see next to how the GDP is tracking and how the Australian economy is tracking every day, we could also see how the environment is tracking and how important that would be to inform decision-making if we could actually hold um, politicians and governments accountable for what is happening in the Australian environment. So they came up with a metric that is something we use today and it's called the ECOND. The ECON stands for the Environmental Condition Index, and it takes complex scientific data and turns it into a score from zero to 100. So 100 represents what the undegraded state of nature would look like. Um, and zero means you have no ecological function left for that environmental asset. And so the whole idea of turning it into a score from zero to 100 is that it's really easy for people to understand and digest so we get these um, reports every so often about how the state of environment is in Australia, but it can be really hard for the general public to actually read and comprehend um, in an easy way what is happening to the Australian nature and who is responsible for that. So in Accounting for Nature today, we use the ECOND that was developed by the Wentworth Group. So Accounting for Nature, as I mentioned, is a non-for-profit we are a certification standard. So we tell, uh, we have rules, I should say, on how to build and certify environmental accounts. And so we certify accounts that are built in accordance to our standard. We also accredit scientific methods uh, for how to measure and monitor the environment. We have something called the Science Accreditation Standard, who is an independent panel of scientists and they make sure all methods that are being put forth under a framework has scientific rigor behind them. And so we don't develop methods ourselves. They're developed by third party organizations. Um, and then our science accreditation committee makes sure that they meet the rigor that's required under our framework. Because we are a certification standard, we cannot go out and build environmental accounts because it would be a conflict of interest if we did the data collection and then certified our own data. So what we do instead is that we train people in how to do environmental accounting. Um, so Misty is an example of someone who is an accredited expert with us. And that means that she's qualified to go out and build environmental accounts um, and help others in doing so. And so we provide coaching and advice to our experts um, and also to people who are developing methods. We are also trying to make the whole process of environmental accounting more accessible and cost effective. So as a big part of that, we are developing an online accounting platform 
that is really there to streamline the process of environmental accounting, remove human errors and make it more intuitive to use. Now, there's a lot of reasons for why people are looking at doing environmental accounting. So I'm gonna talk about a few of them. So at the core of everything is really informed management. So environmental accounts can help to be tools in decision-making. They're really there to see, you know, are the efforts I'm putting into the environment really paying off? Are we getting an improvement by what we are doing? And, you know, oftentimes if we talk about productive environments, um, at some stage, you know, we can find synergies or trade-offs. So it's all about getting information about those just so that we have more information for our decision-making. There's also financial reasons to why people do environmental accounting and they can be both direct and indirect. So in Queensland, we are quite lucky to have something called the Land Restoration Fund. And that is a fund um, that has been set up by the Queensland government to purchase what is called carbon and co-benefit credits. What that means is that you have carbon credits who are also providing other environmental benefits. So we certify those other environmental benefits. And so through those, um, participants can see a substantial increase in pay compared to what they can get if they just sell standalone carbon credits on the market. We are also working more and more in the financial sector, so insurance and banking. Uh, we see that a lot more banks are interested in knowing, um, you know, what is the environmental condition on the property that is being sold? What is the risk to us uh, from a financial perspective? And that comes down both to providing uh, mortgages for ag investment, but also for um, banks that are actually investing in current operations in the agricultural sector. We work with companies like um, Kilter Rule, who are using our accounts to underpin improvements they see across their productive properties. So they have a lot of people investing in them because they are promising to improve environmental condition across their properties. And so accounting for nature is the base of evidence to say that, yes, we are actually improving the environment on the properties we are buying. And then lastly, the example I wanted to take up is food and fiber labeling. Uh, we are seeing more and more kind of niche market spaces in the food space where people want to know where the products are coming from. They want to be able to go in and read about the property that they're buying their meat from or their veggies from. And so by developing environmental account, that's providing transparency on your property and what you do that you can then communicate um, to your consumers and provide them with trust in that they're actually buying from someone um, who is taking care of the environment on the properties. So in Queensland, um, the larger carbon aggregators and any carbon aggregator who are setting up projects under the Land Restoration Fund um, are using us to build environmental accounts. There is a recently um, launched market space called Nature Plus, and so this was created by Green Collar. They are currently in the first year of a three-year trial phase. So they're kind of dipping their toes in the moment into see what could a standalone biodiversity um, credit market space look like. So they're working with about 20 properties at the moment and developing environmental accounts on those properties. Um, to try to sell credits for improving or maintaining a good condition of the environment. So what they're trying to skip, um, scope out now is um, who are the buyers, you know, what are the buyers willing to pay and is this a feasible market mechanism. With that being said, we are an independent certification standard. So that means that we can really underpin and provide integrity to any type of market space where we are looking at environmental improvements. At the moment, there are 48 environmental accounts spread across Australia, um, covering about 6 million hectares. And so the smallest account we have at the moment is about 15 hectares. Accounts can be smaller. Um, and the biggest one we have is a regional account in um, by the Brunet Mary Regional Group, and that covers about 5.5 million hectares. And we are Queensland heavy at the moment, thanks to the Land Restoration Fund. 
So when we talk about environmental asset under accounting for nature, we break them down into four different categories. So we split it into soil, fauna, freshwater, marine and vegetation. Carbon is sitting on the side because we don't provide methods for how to measure carbon. We don't certify carbon credits, but under some programs, these other environmental assets can be linked as co-benefits to carbon credits. This is a snapshot of what an environmental account can look like. So we break all the environmental components into those asset classes. So on the snapshot here, you can see we have measured condition for fauna, soil and vegetation. It tells you the area that it was measured across. If you are looking at a property and you're measuring a part of your property and not all of it, it will also come up as a pie chart saying, you know, what percentage of your property the account covers. And so that's just really important for integrity and transparency. The first year you go out and measure environmental condition, you will get something called a baseline econt. So that's simply the first year or the first score that you get. Under the Accounting for Nature framework, we require you to re-measure at least every five years. You can do it more often if you want to, but that's the minimum that we require. Every econ score is then associated to a certain confidence level. So this is relating to how accurate that econ score is in re representing the condition of the environment. The lowest level of accuracy of methods that we approve are 80%. Um, there are then methods that go up to 90% accuracy and 95% accuracy. And so what accuracy level is suitable depends on the purpose of the account. So if you're looking at informing management decisions or your conservation efforts, oftentimes 80% um, accuracy is absolutely sufficient for this. If you are looking at generating credits through the Land Restoration Fund or through Nature Plus, they require you to have a higher level of accuracy because as soon as we put dollar values on the environment, we need more confidence in that what we measured is actually true. So at the bottom, you can see something that looks very similar to financial balance sheets. So it's breaking down what you have measured into its components. So for vegetation, we are looking at the different ecosystems um, that exist in, across the area. And so you get an econ score for every ecosystem you measure and you will then see plus minus um, trends over time. So you can think of us very similar to financial accounting, only that we are accounting for the environment instead. And with every account comes something that's called an information statement. Information statements are really transparency documents. They go through in detail the context of the account. So that means, you know, if you're a productive property, what are you doing on your property? Why are you developing an environmental account? What have you done in the past in terms of improving the environment? You can include photos, etc. You can also talk about where you want to go. So are you hoping to improve it? Are you hoping to maintain? What are your goals? It then goes into detail describing the methods that have been used to generate the econ, how you applied it, what the outcomes were, and if there are any uh, limitations um, to how you apply them as well. So it's really there for transparency and integrity purposes. So with our accredited methods, every method is developed for a specific purpose. So they're also developed for a specific environmental asset. So if you want to measure vegetation and soil, you would need to use two methods. So we don't have one method that measures, you know, biodiversity broadly, they're all quite specific. They also developed as specific, uh, specific confidence levels. So that's the accuracy levels you see on the right hand side of the screen. And then for a particular scale. So we break it down to either the local scale, which is your property or your project, and then a regional scale, which is when we talk about councils, states, and NRM bodies, and those small overarching um, bodies that manage natural resources in big areas. I'm just going to go through because uh, finding a method can be a bit challenging. So I wanted to dig into detail on just the process of identifying a method that's relevant for you. So firstly, as I mentioned, we break them down into the various asset classes. 
Some methods are really broad. So a lot of our vegetation methods can be used across any ecosystem anywhere in Australia. Same with soil. Some methods are more specific, and this is really common when we talk about fauna methods. Um, so whilst we have a broader mammal condition method, we also have a koala method, and we have a rock wallaby method being developed. It all comes down to purpose. So if you're a conservation organization, you are targeting a specific species, you probably don't need to measure all the species in the area, but you would only measure what's important to uh, the core of what you do. So things to look for when selecting a method is firstly the accuracy. The higher the accuracy, the more confidence you will have in your econ, but the more difficult it will be to implement. So there's always a trade off in complexity of method um, versus how confident you are in your school. You then need to make sure that the scale is the right one for you. So typically that would be project or property. You need to make sure that it can be applied in the area you live in. Most of our methods are Australia wide, but some are restricted to a state or a part of a state. It will then tell you what the method does, how data is being collected, and what you are measuring using the method. It will then tell you if there's any expertise needed to implement them. So some methods are available for any landholder to pick up and implement if they feel like they've got the skill set to do so. Other methods require you to bring out someone who is an expertise in that um, field to help with the implementation. And this is common where methods are more complex. It will then tell you if the method is available for anyone to um, download and if there's a cost associated to it. Most of our methods are freely available to download and you can do it directly from our website. But because we don't develop methods, but other people do it, they can choose to put a cost to the use of the method. So that will say if there's a license cost associated to the method or not. So it doesn't cost anything to read the method, but there is a charge if you decide to then use it and that money goes back to the method author. Embargo period will tell you if the method is available now or if it will be released later for the public. Often with more complex and novel methods, we recommend authors to put it under a one year embargo to allow them to go out and actually test the method in the field to make sure there's no issues, there's no unclarities in the method before people start downloading it and using it. Because it becomes really difficult to update and amend a method if it's already being broadly used to people. Um, and so embargo can be a maximum of three years. Simpler methods typically have none, more complex methods often have at least a year. So we have a five step approach to developing and certifying environmental accounts. I'm not gonna go into it in too much detail, um, but just a quick overview. Firstly, if you're thinking about the process, you really need to distill down, you know, what is important to you? What decisions is your environmental account going to be informing? Is it conservation efforts? Is it productivity? And then select a method that is suitable for your purpose. You then need to read the method and figure out how to actually apply it to your area. Once you figure this out, it's time to register your environmental account with us. So this is the first step where we really come in. And so we will check that we think the method you selected actually suitable for the purpose that you want it for. And we will also double check that what you are planning on collecting in terms of data in the field actually aligns to the method you selected. It's really important to register before collecting data because that allows us to make sure your sample plan is looking correct. So you don't go out and over or under sample. Once you have registered, that's when you go out and actually collect your data, you calculate the econ, um, and you write your information statement as well. Once you have that data, it's time to submit to us for certification. So there's a range of documents that you would need to send to us for that process. Once it's certified, you need to maintain your account. So go out and remeasure at intervals of minimum five years. And we also require something called an annual certification compliance report. And that is every year letting us know if anything has happened inside the project or property area that can influence the econ going forward. So fires, floods, anything like that needs to be disclosed. We have two different types of certification. Um, we are just going through a rebranding process at the moment. So you're getting a snapshot of what's yet to come. Certification logos will be updated next week as well. 
So with the two different type, what we call tier two or self-verified is accounts that are firstly double-checked by you who are producing the account. And then we in Accounting for Nature do a technical assessment. So we go through and make sure you've actually implemented the account correctly, you calculated the econ correctly. The other type of certification is an independently audited environmental account. And this is a lot more expensive than the self-verified, but it's a requirement if you want to produce credits. So if you want to sell anything to the market, you need to have an independent audit of that data. And so that cost is charged directly by um, the auditor and it gives it more validity. So that includes auditor checking all your data and potentially coming out to your property to double check it as well. All our costs are up on the Accounting for Nature website. So because we are a non-for-profit, um, we charge at cost recovery rates. And it's a staggered approach where smaller landholders charge a little bit less than cost recovery. Um, and larger organizations, uh, we charge a little bit more than cost recovery to kind of even that out. Um, but the fee schedule goes through depending on the size of your organization and what you want to measure, um, what the costs are for registration and certification. So really importantly, with the Accounting for Nature logo for certified accounts is that we're quite different from a lot of other sustainability standards in that having an environmental account doesn't automatically mean that you meet a certain threshold or that you are sustainable. And this feeds into the claims that can be made. So Accounting for Nature is really an accounting standard. Um, the certification means that you've used a scientifically rigorous approach to measure environmental condition and that data has been double checked. So it limits the claims you can make. You, so you can't say that I have an environmental account with Accounting for Nature and therefore I'm sustainable. You can talk about your econ score, what you're hoping to achieve, how the econ is tracking over time. This is really, we have pretty strict claims rules to make sure we avoid any greenwashing. Now, as I mentioned, we have something called accredited experts. So these are people who can help you build environmental accounts. Quite often um, these will be consultants and so we split them into two categories. So we have something that we call asset experts or category one experts and so these are people who have a niche scientific expertise and so that can be you know in fauna, soil, uh, water, anything like that that can help you go out and implement the methods in the field. We also have general experts and those are people with a broader background in um, you know, in environmental management or management of natural resources, carbon accounting. So they might not be able to go out and actually help you implement method in the field, but they can help prepare your environmental account before you go out and do field data collection. And they can also help you write the information statement, calculate the econ, etc. So as a landholder, you do not need to use an expert unless you select to use a method that requires you to actually use one. With that being said, if you are a landholder and you want to go through and do the process yourself, so you want to prepare the account, you want to take the measurements in the field, etc., we require you to complete our online training course. So it's a course in environmental accounting. And so that works for us as evidence that you understand the process of developing an environmental account and that we can trust that you can implement the process correctly. Um, so for anyone who's listening today, if you do want a discount, you can put in May 2023, and that will take 20% off from our online training course. And we have a link to the training course on our website as well. So I wanted to wrap up and talk about future training opportunities. We often work with uh, Landcare to deliver full day workshops where we go through some of the more pe popular methods in the field and also sit down together in the office and talk more about the technical aspects of environmental account building. Often we do this when there's a Landcare group where there's a bigger interest. So depending on how organized Landcare groups are in your area, you can either start talking to your local coordinator and see if you can get a group together. Or if you're interested, you can always contact us directly and we can pass this information on to um, Landcare Farming and Landcare Australia and see if there's any way to actually help you get funding to do these workshops. 
We have a face-to-face -face kind of training event coming up um, next Friday in Banana. So maybe that's close to some of you. So if you're interested in joining that, there's a link on our website under training opportunities. And so it's a field day where we are visiting two farmers who have done environmental accounts where they will be talking about the reasons behind it, how they found the process, but I will be there talking to, Landcare will be there talking. Um, so if you're interested in joining, either jump on our website or send me an email um, and we can get you in for next Friday. So with that, I wanted to stop the screen sharing to see if there are any questions. Um, feel free to either unmute yourself or pop them into the chat. Always concerning when no one has questions. I'm not sure if it was all very clear um, or if some of you are sleeping. Um, I'm hoping it was just clear. <laughs> I'm actually interested if anybody has heard of Accounting for Nature or their work before. I have never heard of it. This is the first time. I haven't heard of it either, but that was very interesting. Good. That, that might actually be why you're limited in, in questions too. If there's a lot of information to take on if that's the first time you've been exposed it, to the concept. Yes. It is a lot to digest in uh, 30 minutes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you do have any questions that you can think of uh, later on, please don't hesitate to contact us. I am sitting behind the info at Accounting for Nature email. So if you want to get in touch with me, um, you can just send an email to the info account and I'll get back to you. Thank you. See if I can make you host again, Misty. Yeah, thanks. There we go. Oh, look at that. I am again now. Um, thanks, thanks today uh, for coming today, Amanda. I really appreciate it. Um, and oh, oh, I mean, I love the work that you guys do. But thank you for presenting. Um, if anybody is interested in knowing more, definitely reach out to Amanda and the crew at Accounting for Nature. I will send an email at the end of the workshop with uh, links to a lot of the resources from the workshop today, but also with the contacts for Accounting for Nature. So you'll be able to contact them there as well. Well, thank you again. Um, are you heading off now or? Yes, I am. I've got a lot of work to catch up on today, unfortunately. Okay, excellent. Right, enjoy the rest of the workshop. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have put in the in the chat some links. So there's project information, but there's also a greater glider guide in the chat there if anybody would like to open it and have a look. We will be going through a lot of that um, information today. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Misty. I'm an ecologist with Burnett Catchment Care Association. They operate within the Burnett Catchment, which is over, or the entire land area is over half the size of Tasmania. So it's, it's quite a large area, but they've been operating for about 30 years now and do a lot of on-ground projects in the areas of sustainable agriculture and environmental projects. I've been with them for about five years. The Greater Glider project that BCCA has at the moment is, um, uh, it's very community focused. So it's not a research program. We are not experts in Greater Gliders, but it is an on-ground implementation project for the Upper Burnet. So we've targeted a number of project, a number of properties up in the area, which are grazing properties and uh, a mining rehab site. And we've done a, a number of um, different activities up there that I'll go through today and we'll be monitoring them and their success over the next 12 months to see how they go. Today we'll be going through, so if you if you haven't or don't know much about greater gliders, today is about that. And if you'd like to know more about how you can encourage greater glider conservation on your own property, then today's workshop 
will be good for that. But if you're looking for um, a specialist in greater gliders, I'm not it. <laughs> so I'm going to go about sharing my screen now. If you have any questions throughout the workshop, please pop them in the chat and Katie, our general manager, is going to collate those questions for me to answer at the end. Um, now. Okay, so I might just leave it on that view. It might be easiest to see. Um, I haven't delivered this workshop online. I did a field day last week, which was great. Unfortunately, you guys don't get to go out to one of the sites that we've done these activities on and actually see it in the field. But I'll, I'll share some photos at the end of um, this presentation to give you a bit of an idea. There is some photos in the presentation itself, but give you a bit of an idea of what has occurred um, on those properties uh, in the Upper Burnett and how that was done. Um, but it is a shame that you don't get to, to see it. So, but we'll see how we go with me. Um, presenting this. So this is part of the Saving the Endangered, Saving the Endangered Greater Glider of the Upper Burnett project that we're delivering. Um, it's part of a community education program plus enhancing habitat and nesting sites to assist the recovery in the in the region. I did say before it's it's a project that has been funded by Wires National Gants Program and Evolution Mining. It's also supported by the Men's Shed Monto, which have um, built and uh, created all the nesting boxes that we're using for the project. Uh, Gundagam Pastoral Company, uh, Wildlife Preservation Society of Queensland by extension, the Glider Network, Accounting for Nature and Safe Haven. Australian Animal Care and Education. This is a greater glider. Uh, it's a, there's, I have to apologise, there's a few photos in here that are a bit grainy. I've done the best I could. But this is a greater glider from the Upper Burnet, actually on Gundana Gum uh, Pastoral Company, where we held the workshop last week and you got to see one of the sites there. Um, Greater gliders come in a variety of uh, colour morphs, which I'll explain, but this one happens to be quite a pale one. This, it was emerging out of the uh, top of a hollow. It was a living tree, but the hollow or the branch that this particular hollow was in was um, dead. So there is value in non-living hollows uh, and non-living trees with hollows within a landscape. So just a little brief bit about what greater gliders are. Greater glider are the world's largest gliding marsupial and the second largest gliding mammal. I, th I think the, the largest gliding mammal is in Asia somewhere and it's like a gliding a squirrel something. Um, can glide, so greater gliders can glide up to 100 metres, uh, more closely related to ringtail possums than they are to other gliders. Uh, they can reach approximately one metre in length and 1.7 kilos in weight and come in multiple colours, including dark browns, creams, greys, light dark greys, or a combination of, of any of those. Uh, a population within an area may consist of one colour morph or it may consist of multiple colour morphs, even within related individuals. They are hollow dependent, so they completely rely, a population will be completely reliant on hollows and the number and the size of hollows that exist within the environment. They are nocturnal, so you'll only ever see them active at night time usually, unless they're disturbed. Feeding, they are feeding specialists on eucalypts, same diet as koalas. The difference between the habitat usage is this dependency on hollows for nesting and resting sites. Their populations have decreased by 80% over the last two decades and they are listed as endangered to extinction. 
The reason why they need hollows, so hollows are used by greater gliders as nighttime dens for reproduction and protection from their most, their greatest predator, the powerful owl. So this is a powerful owl here. And if you look down in the in the talons and claws there, you can see a, a, a possum or an arboreal of some description. There are effective predators. So greater gliders are known to have relatively small home ranges of one to nine hectares, but will use up to 20 dens within that area um, that they use on a random rotational basis. This is presumably so that they can evade powerful owls that will stake out the hollows waiting for the glider to return. So a powerful owl will sit by a hollow, see a glider come out of it, and then he'll sit there and he'll wait for him to return. Hence why if you're a, a glider and you've got a big owl uh, hanging around waiting to eat you, you're probably going to, to, to choose a different location to where that owl is sitting. Um, it was interesting to talk to property owners uh, at the workshop last week who had noted that when they've seen them emerge from their dens in the evening, they sit there for a little while and, and take it all in, have a good look around, a good scan, clean themselves. Um, and before returning to a hollow at night time, they'll do the same thing, have a good scan for predators, see what's going on, and then enter their, um, their hollow. Presumably that would be, you might not enter that hollow if you've got a big predator like a, a powerful owl sitting there waiting to watch you uh, go to bed at night because he might just return the next evening and wait for you to emerge. Greater glider habitat. So uh, in the Burnett, uh, they've been known to prefer ironbark forest, forests. But this might be because there are more hollows uh, recorded in those kinds of forests and they're rather than that is the kind of food source that they prefer to eat. They do, however, occupy eucalypt forests, open woodlands, uh, gum top box trees, uh, forests, providing there is enough nesting habitat because they're entirely um, hollow dependent. If there are no hollows, there are no greater gliders. Uh, no information of what they prefer to eat in the burnet catchment currently exists, but in other areas it includes spotted gum, pink bloodwood, narrow-leafed ironbark and red gum or forest red gum. Bushfires, flood and housing. So bushfires will denude a landscape if they're hot enough and heat the soil at depth, increasing weeds and decreasing preferred species diversification. So you might get a lot of uh, species diversification in the weeds that you have presence, but not potentially in the kinds of uh, species that you would like. Bushfires also increase native or can also increase native animals and livestock's vulnerability to starvation and predation. If hot enough, they will destroy old trees, living and dead, and therefore the nesting habitats of uh, numerous arboreals, including the greater glider. Cultural and cool burns have a ben the benefit of reducing fuel loads, which is fairly obvious, um, but they also remove woody weeds and pest species. They can improve pasture and maintain the integrity of larger trees and canopy cover because they don't burn it. We are very fortunate last week uh, at the field day to have traditional owners that specialise in cultural burns. So they're able to speak about um, the practical side as well as the cultural side of their burning techniques and also from property owners, including the Campbells from Gundagum Pastoral Company that could talk about how they utilise cool burning in their production system in a mosaic way so that they maintain a pastoral uh, pasture for their, for their livestock, but also from the perspective of maintaining uh, biodiversity within the insect population, so assassin bugs and things like that. They've also noticed that when they do cool burns in a mosaic peer way, they have uh, a quicker recovery time in the areas that have been uh, cool burned and they don't 
create any damage to the trees that they have up there, particularly some of their old growth trees that may have been scarred or have dead bits on them and, and that are more vulnerable to fires. So slow, cool burns can reduce the risk of bushfires and improve grazing. Um, high ground and slow breeding. So greater gliders tend to prefer habitat at the top of hills and ridge tops away from riparian zones and waterways. Um, they obtain all their water from their diet and they can't swim. <laughs> so that lessens their need and their desire to be near water. Um, and they're highly solitary. They can, so they've been recorded to live up to 15 years of age and they typically only will only share a den space during the breeding season. Otherwise, otherwise they will um, typically be entirely solitary for the rest of the year. They do not reproduce every season, which makes their breeding cycles incredibly slow and it slows conservation and recovery efforts also. Um, they fly with their elbows out. So with um, other gliding marsupials or even bats, the gliding membrane will attach at the wrist. Uh, with greater gliders, they attach at the elbow um, and they tuck their little hands under their chin. What it seems to do is because they're such a large animal, this doesn't decrease the amount of gliding membrane that they have available, but it also makes them highly maneuverable in flight. So they are capable of doing turns of up to 90 degrees in mid-flight um, and they can glide up to 100 metres. So they do prefer forests that are a little bit more open where they can glide from one tree to the next, which makes grazing production systems um, quite good for greater gliders um, rather than that really dense vegetation where they've, they've got a little hop pop or fight through some canopy cover. Where they have those, those open forests where they can glide easily from very large established trees to the next tree, it allows them to move around within that habitat quite well. Um, they do prefer um, a range of different species to, to feed upon. So um, a forest with diversity in trees is also more desirable than it is in terms of a monoculture. So you can't really tell terribly well on this, this photo, but if you look really hard, you can see the little hands tucked up underneath his chin and these are his elbows sitting out um, here. Should you restore or retain habitat, it is definitely easier and cheaper to manage and protect and retain the habitat that you already have. Uh, old hollow trees are not ideal for timber harvesting, but can exist well in a grazing production or a seed trees in a private forestry harvesting system. So it is, um, if you can maintain those old growth trees within your property within you, your environment, they are the ones that are highly relied upon by a whole range of arboreals as well as birds, hollow nesting birds, um, and they can have benefit to the overall system. Old trees also provide shade, biodiversity and fertility values while maintaining critical habitat for native species such as birds and gliders. Regrowth is easier and cheaper if you're going to, to look at adding trees to your system than it is to restore or through um, replanting. But supplementary planting may boost restoration efforts where natural germination is limited or it's limited to the number um, or number and or species. Hollows are by far the greatest limiting factor for greater gliders in abundance. Um, are nesting boxes a good alternative? If there are housing shortage in your local greater glider community, strategically placed nesting boxes can provide a suitable short-term alternative for up to 10 years. Another more permanent option is having living hollows professionally carved into large trees by an arborist 
while they will last the life of the tree, presumably up to 100 years, they are also more expensive to install. And I will go through um, the living hollows that we've had installed as part of this project and explain the process in which they went about doing that. Some of the, the, the things that they've uh, identified for us in terms of installing them and the longevity on how to on how they might be managed or actually managed by the native fauna of all things, which is really interesting. Here is a, a nesting box that was installed at one of the sites. Uh, that nesting box was made by the local men's shed. They did give a brief talk last week on how they went about doing that. In the guide that you can download off our website, it does give you a plan on how to build them. They built all the nesting boxes for this project out of donated timber and uh, recycled pallets. And the good thing that we liked about that was that it made it potentially more achievable for landholders who wanted to go about making their own nesting boxes themselves. It, it gave them something that was cheap, accessible and achievable. The, the installation of nesting boxes for greater gliders might be a, a more logistical challenge which is why we've asked uh, everyone who attends the workshops to register their interest in having them professionally installed on their properties because we do have some funding to install additional nesting boxes around the region for this project. If you are to replant, what species, or if you are to restore a habitat, what species should you encourage? Uh, the answer is not just eucalypts. Biodiversity is essential for ecosystems and for fertility, whether in natural landscapes or in production systems. You should encourage what existed prior to disturbance. The Queensland Government has a website and it is listed in the guide that you can download. Uh, greater gliders prefer to eat young leaves of eucalypts high, that are high in nitrogen and they're much lower in fibre. So eucalyptus is tremendously difficult to digest and um, it is the same diet as koalas. They do have, uh, koalas have a, a unique uh, gut flora to help with that process and sleep a lot. Um, but greater gliders are also known to eat the buds and flowers of eucalypts, the young codes, I don't know how to say this, uh, radiata pines, they will eat wattle leaves, uh, which are not true leaves. So wattles or acacia species only have tree, true leaves when they first sprout. And if you've noticed when the seedlings first pop up, there are these tiny little leaf nodes, they're true leaves. After that, the stem actually modifies and it's, it's a modified stem, which makes them incredibly hardy, but they're not, not actual leaves. So greater gliders are known to eat some of them. Most wattle species, particularly in the burnet, uh, like black wattle, have a limited lifespan. Um, however, brigolo and some of those other species have a much longer lifespan. They will also have also been known to eat mistletoe. Variety is key, and there are planting tips in the guide, <clears throat> but one of the key, key tips is to have your trees, if you are planting or encouraging wreath growth, within gliding distance to allow that movement around a landscape. Food for thought. Um, if you are in a production system, the more critters are eating lots of different things within your landscape and pooping out little bite-sized fertiliser pellets, the more fertile your soil and more productive your land is long-term. We had um, Rob from Gundigam talk last week about how they very much focus on biodiversity within their grazing production system to help with the production of their pasture, as well as the overall health of their ecosystem. They find that this has built resilience within their landscape and within their production system, particularly in times of drought. Um, 
the the more um, from a biodiversity perspective, the more things that you have decomposing within your landscape, the more fertile that you're able or the more fertility that's able to be returned to a soil. So even though this project is uh, focused on a threatened species, which is the greater glider, it is also concentrating on private forestry, which is under production or under rehabilitation on a mine site. One of the reasons why we particularly focused on that is that the majority of land within Australia is held but in private um, uh, freehold and a lot of it's under production. So anything that we can do to improve conservation values as well as um, improving uh, ag sustainable agriculture on these landscapes has to be a win. It's also the, the greatest economy within uh, the burnet. So the burnet is an agricultural econo economy with grazing being its uh, highest production. Other benefits of trees to agriculture. Restoration and retention of habitat trees also assists erosion control, stream bank stabilisation, improved water quality and other natural capital values. Shade for livestock, improved soil fertility, which we've been talking about, but also moisture retention for pasture growth. The more the more plantation uh, pollinators within the system for cropping and uh, horticulture. Carbon sequestration, carbon and co-benefits, and biodiversity markets, which was touched on by Amanda from Accounting for Nature. I'm going to talk about fencing. So glider friendly yet cattle proof fencing. So barbed wire is often necessary for grazing production systems. Cattle have very little respect for plain wire unless it's electrified. Um, and it's not always financially and practically viable to electrify your fences. But barbed wire can also be lethal to gliders. Um, one top planed, uh, plain top wire can dramatically improve glider injuries and fertilities, uh, fertilities without compromising the effect on cattle with the remaining barbed wire. Uh, where possible in larger, larger paddocks where the cattle have less reason to crawl through a fence, you may even uh, decide to experiment with two wires. So that was something that was discussed by property owners last week where they have found in some of their larger paddocks, two plain top wires was effective in keeping their cattle in. Um, and they also found that glider, not necessarily just greater gliders, but sugar gliders as well, when they hit that first wire, they can flip and then get entangled on the, on the second wire. So in those larger paddocks, they've actually found that two top wires has meant they've had no fertilities and no entanglements within their, their fencing for gliders and they don't have cattle creeping through the fence either. But if you're in a smaller, um, more intense grazing system, that second top wire might not necessarily be practical where, a top, where the first top wire might uh, be a, a more practical solution for you. It is most economic to do that during construction rather than going back and, and rehashing your fence, but prioritise your tree defence lines. It's not necessary on open pasture where the gliders won't be gliding. So gliders are more vulnerable to entanglement along movement corridors in forested areas. Uh, these should be the priority zones for glider proofing fencing if you are to install them. This, this photo here is from the Wildlife Preservation Society of Queensland, and it comes out of one of their resources that they have. Spotlighting uh, greater gliders. So if you were to go looking for greater gliders, uh, spotlighting for eye shine can be an effective way to go looking for them. Their eye shine is unique in that it glows white yellow to bright orange and they're usually quite close together. So it, it can be an, an easy and effective way of spotting them in the treetops. They are very quiet. They do not vocalise like some of the other species might. 
Uh, do not, but however, don't continue to shine them in their eyes. Uh, like anyone that's had a torch shine in their eyes, it can be quite blinding. If you do, you have, so please use a dimmer or swap to a duller torch light. So carry another a torch around with you or use a, a red filter once you've spotted the gliders. Uh, a nights of little to no moon while focusing on the highest branches of the oldest trees is often the most useful. So this is their, their eye shine. They're quite unique in the way that the coloration of the eye shine is. I do not know why. So you could put that in the, um, in the questions in the chat, but I don't know how to answer it. Stag watching and wildlife cameras. So stag watching is where you stake out a suspected den uh, or hollow of old trees on dusk. Um, I do not, if you're going to do stag watching, don't shine a spotlight directly on the hollow because whatever's in there is going to avoid emerging until they are satisfied that you've gone. So you might just uh, sit there and stake uh, after dark or on dusk until an hour after dark. Uh, remain silent and continue for an hour after sunset. You can place wildlife cameras at nesting boxes or um, suspected den sites. Remember, it may take a little while for gliders to feel comfortable with new, new boxes. So do be patient. It has been noted that it can take up to a year for gliders to feel comfortable with installed boxes. So don't feel disheartened if you have a box that hasn't been inhabited yet. You may wish to occasionally use a lure such as real Canadian maple syrup for monitoring, but don't, the, the challenge is, is not to use it as a feeding station. So if you happen to be monitoring a nesting site, uh, a lure such as real Canadian maple syrup, not the, not the cheap stuff, the expensive stuff, um, can be a good one to use as a, as a scent lure to bring them in. But again, like I said, don't use it as a feeding station where they become dependent. These are wildlife cameras. This is um, a greater glider that was caught during monitoring. Um, and this is a, a, a platform with, a, with maple syrup, Canadian maple syrup used as a lure on that one. You can see when they're not gliding, their gliding membrane can look very much like an oversized trench coat. Uh, which gives them a really unique look too. Nesting box alternatives. So if you're not going to use nesting boxes, what are your alternatives? Habitat retention is always, again, like I said before, easier and cheaper than restoration uh, and more time efficient from your input point of view. Natural hollows are naturally thermoregulating and can last more than 100 years, so many generations of glider. Nesting boxes are a good temporary option, five to 10 years. Uh, there are some alternatives within the market that uh, contain plastics and various other things. We've gone with natural wood so that as it does biodegrade, because everything will degrade, it will, it will degrade and uh, compost and be broken down naturally within the environment without leaving any um, microplastics and such. Um, you can mount fallen hollow trees. <clears throat> so there, in some areas, um, if there has been a, a, a fallen hollow tree that has fallen over, people have um, uprighted them and, and set them into the ground and they have been utilised again by our burials, including, including greater gliders. Um, or you can have a licensed professional arborist install hollows into established living trees, which will also last the life of the tree and potentially many hundreds of years. So <clears throat> this is Habitech, who have, they really pioneered uh, these carved hollows. So they work a lot with, or have been working a lot in the last number of years with local government to install and test out these living hollows. So we're really keen to see how they work in our catchment area. Here they, they climb up a tree and they cut a back plate off the back of the, the tree. They then carve out the inside with um, 
a chainsaw and a chisel. They put the back plate back on and they use very large stainless steel screws, like very large ones. And because it has to hold that black plate long enough for the tree to heal over those wound sockets um, and then become a permanent fixture. They also create a hollow, uh, an entryway at the front here. And what they found is a lot of parrots will actually keep that entryway from closing over, not only in these hollows, um, but it's been noted in other hollows, naturally occurring hollows. Parrots will often keep that wound open so that it, it, it keeps that uh, entry wide. So these are, are the size trees. They're not very good photos here, but these are the size trees that we've used. So they are regrowth trees. Um, they are regrowth trees, but they're not old enough to have established their own hollows in them. And a nesting box of five to 10 years is not going to be long enough for that tree to establish its own hollows. So we have uh, three treatments that we're trialling. It's more of a personal thing for me to see um, where we've, we've either painted the nesting boxes We've oiled it with uh, vegetable oil and we've left them untreated. So within the same site, we will have uh, these different treated nesting boxes and we're going to monitor to see if there is a difference um, in occupation of these nesting boxes over time. I'll stop sharing that and I'll see if I can share some of the photos from the project. I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, Um, here we've got an arborist up there. What I didn't mention before is they actually cut. So when they look at a tree to see whether it's suitable for installing these, um, these carved hollows, they'll look for one that has multiple stems off the main trunk. These trees are typically not ideal for um, timber harvest anyway because they're not straight, but they do have... Um, a large branch. What this allows them to do is to prune the top of those branches because where they put the hollow in will is presumably the weakest point on the branch. So if it was to snap or compromise, it will most likely compromise at the point that that carved hollow has been uh, placed within the branch. So they can decrease the chances of those, those nesting sites being compromised by cutting the top of the branch off. It will re-sprout, but by allowing, but only doing that within trees that have multiple leaders like that, it allows enough of the canopy to be maintained by the tree that it is still producing enough food to punch out those new growths in where they've been pruned, but also maintain the integrity of the tree health. That was a, a photo that I shared before. This is a closer look. So th they can install a number of living hollows within the same branch. So this one has two in it. There's the, the entry way of the, the first one at the top, but further down you can see the back plate of the second hollow that's been carved into that, that branch. On the front, this is how they carve the entryways in and um, they maintain a wound around the entry like that. And parrots, like I said, will keep that gnarled away. If um, what they have found in some of the other areas that they've, they've done, they haven't necessarily, uh, in some of the local government areas such as the Gold Coast, they may be targeting other species other than greater glider. 
And there may not necessarily be the diversity within those landscapes because they're, they're surrounded by uh, dense urbanisation. That if there aren't uh, species such as parrots to maintain that entryway, it will heal over, but smaller other smaller species will still utilise that. And in some cases, the, the hole has gotten small enough that they've, they've ended up with native beehives within there. So it will be used by something. Haven't had any of them heal over entirely. In the burnet here, we do have quite a diversity of larger parrots that will be interesting to see over the next year how these particular hollows go in the various sites that we've we've installed them and the and the various landscapes to see if they have enough parrots and various creatures keeping those entryways open. So that's the the one of the painted boxes and this is um, an oiled one, just very cheap vegetable oil. The way that they installed these boxes was to put wire through the the lid of here just under the lid there but the wire is then covered in just a piece of hosing to allow it not to bite into the tree and wound it over time and is placed over a branch typically you would look for at least 10 meters in height for greater gliders but if you can't install at 10 meters of height then any height is better than none and something is will use user box so even if you're not targeting greater gliders and you're targeting um, other arboreals and marsupials then at any kind of height is going to be of benefit. Habitech also uh, use fallen timber to make the same carved hollows but in a nesting box style. Um, it'd be the, there are some uh, projects that have utilized fallen hollows and cut them up and then also mounted them within trees to some success. Uh, so some landholders do do that to increase nesting and den sites within their landscape. That's basically, oh, and there this. <laughs> so yeah, so back to that picture so that of them. And that's that's pretty much all I have to to present today. Um, I was hoping that we'd get it in before the two o'clock mark. Um, Katie, were there many many questions there? Can you hear me, Lucy? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, we've got two questions here. Nicole would like to know what colour you're painting the boxes and if they're the same colour as the tree bar. Yeah, so the colour that we used was called beige chalk, uh, the paint colour, and it is pretty close to uh, the spotted gums that a lot of a lot of the boxes were mounted in. They were also mounted in iron bark and other species, but that was one of the most common species that were up there. Uh, we also, as I said, did um, we oiled them with cheap vegetable oil and some we've left untreated. Yep. Um, Nicole also wants to know if you've found the greater gliders using either the nesting boxes or the carved hollows. I guess it's up to <laughs> the early days, so not yet, but um, no. can you like explain? We've only just had them installed, actually. So we were waiting to get them installed before we could uh, run the workshops because we really wanted to do a field day just to show people where they were. We also have a number of wildlife cameras, a thermal camera and a night vision monocular that we're going to be using for the monitoring. Unfortunately, I went and uh, ordered the wrong size SD cards. So I've had to return them and get some new ones. But as soon as we get the... The monitoring out it will be really interesting to see what is what the occupation is but at the moment we don't have any information on that yet um and gary and vicky want to know is there a visible indicator on the exterior of living hollows which can indicate the presence of greater gliders like any staining or mm. like um scratch marks 
that because they're such a light, uh, a light mammal, a light animal, they typically don't leave the scratch marks that you would expect to see for larger animals like goannas and koalas. The best way to see if it's occupied or not is to stake it out at night time. Some, some projects I have read about them using a piece of string, putting a piece of string at the doorway to see if somebody's gone in and that will they'll push the string in. But at the same time, animals and parrots and, and different things will completely pull that string off. So it ends up making it a little bit counterproductive. The best way is to watch them at night time. Um, and Lucy wants to know, do you know if there's been evidence of them using carved hollows at other sites? Yes, there has, which is why we wanted to trial it here. So there has been, I would have to find out what the, the region is specifically for you, but it was one of um, the southern local government areas down in the southeast corner where they have monitored and shown greater gliders to be utilising the hollows. So the way that uh, Habitat ended up trialling this, which was quite a number of years ago, was uh, Steve, one of the founders, did his, his apprenticeship under a fellow who was utilising it in the UK for microbats. And then he moved out to Australia and decided to start trialling it for Australian fauna. That's been taken up by uh, a lot of local governments predominantly within the southeast Queensland corner. And they've been monitoring those hollows over the last five years. Oh, yes, at Regland and, and Morton Regional Area. Um, so... Um, we that's why we've brought it up here to see how it will go in the in the central Queensland area, which is a lot more arid. We do have large open forested areas and we do have uh, greater glider populations here. So the sites that we've chosen are known to have greater gliders. Um, we've just chosen particular locations that are, are low in density for hollows because they are hollow dependent to increase that habitat and hopefully improve uh, the populations within those areas. Um, Jeremy says that he's heard in the past the importance of thermal regulation for hollows and that that being a draw, um, drawback for nest boxes. Do you find the same? Um, I couldn't tell you if we find the same yet, so it'll be interesting. Um, but that is true. That was one of the reasons, again, why we looked at the uh, putting them alongside, uh, putting the carved hollows alongside the nesting boxes. So what that will utilise is the tree's natural thermoregulation with um, the, their own capillary action up and down. So that helps insulate for both cooling and heating or cooling and, and heat retention. Um, the nesting boxes, typically, they suggest that you mount them on the southeastern side of a tree to get as much shade for the hot periods as possible. There are some um, innovations that are, are going on in regards to uh, making nesting boxes, which is utilising styrofoam as um, insulation with inside the nesting box. So putting uh, a, a two sort of like a nesting box inside a nesting box and then putting styrofoam in between that. There are some that are utilising plastics to, to improve thermoregulation and, and fire retardants in push fire prone areas. Um, we're not doing any of those trials. We're only trialling basic nesting boxes that are achievable um, and financially cost effective for most people and something easy that they can make themselves um, and these carved hollows. Um, and Sue would like to know, are possum box openings the same width as glider box openings? That's a good question. There is a... Um, there's a blueprint in the guide. I'll put I'll put uh, the links again in the chat. So in the guide, 
there is a blueprint in there. We didn't make the boxes ourselves. The men's shed did. That uh, blueprint there are a num comes from a, a number of standard diets. So that's the greater glider standard for boxes, typically that is suggested. There are a number of other boxes. So I think you'd probably have to look at that blueprint and then compare it to a, a possum box to see if it is the same size. But they are similar sized animals. However, greater gliders tend to be really skinny, whereas possums tend to be a lot more stockier and musclier. These guys are very skinny and light to aid their gliding. So they may, I'm wondering if they might actually not need an opening as big as a possum box. Well, that's all the questions that have come in as of now, Missy. Okay, excellent. Um, I will send out an email later on with those links and some links for accounting for nature. It may take me a little while to get this recording up. Um, but I will send out an email as soon as it's to everybody who's registered, uh, including the ones that weren't able to make it today. Um, so thank you for, for coming. Uh, really appreciate uh, your time and hopefully it was is useful. In the chat also, there is um, a link to our feedback form. So as part of our funding and running these community workshops, we do have a feedback form. It also allows, while it also allows us to see whether the workshop hit the mark or not, it also uh, allows you to register your interest to have nesting boxes installed. So if you're interested in that, please fill that out when you fill out the feedback form. And I think that's it. Is there anything else you can think of, Katie? That's wonderful. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, and I might get going. Have a good rest of your day and the rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you.